All right, brother. So you sent me a text today. Today is Wednesday. It's the 27th of August. You have been teaching with students for about a week and a half now. I am about to get started on my team meetings tomorrow. And you sent me a text that said you wanted to talk about teacher. And it just said a title. It was teacher. You are enough. So let's let's give our listeners the backstory of what this conversation is uh, you know um we were in you know you know we've been in it going at it now uh a week and two days officially uh because we shut down uh because of hurricane laura in the gulf so we been you know we sh our district shut down uh today wednesday thursday friday suspended all classes and activities um but during in our prep time, there's time for teachers to come together and kind of uh, share ideas, different things that they're doing. And man, I gotta say, I am blown away at when I get an opportunity because we share, you know, they, we share screens and teachers share what they're doing, what their scheduling looks like, how they plan things and how they do it. And I'm looking at some of our seventh and eighth grade teachers, and they are. I mean, they're freaking rock stars, man. Like, like I'm, I'm excited to be on a team of people who do the things that they do, you know, from adding voice recorded instructions with every instruction that they use to adding daily and weekly agendas to every single course that they're teaching. Like, it's just blowing my mind completely. Um, and one of the undercover things, current I mean, underflowing things that was going around is that they kept feeling like they were not doing enough. Uh, they would get emails from parents and not all parents, but they would get email from parents who were saying, you know, this is not enough. Or they would get, you know, mentions, you know, I've had friends from other schools and other campuses who are saying their admins are saying, you're not doing enough. I need you to do more. Oh, you're, you're meeting this much. I need you to meet more. I need you to do more. And I had to stop us and I said, guys, I just wanna share with you that no matter what the, your administration says, no matter what the parents say, no matter what the students say, being there for your kids in the way that we're doing, it's enough. And I think that if you hear you're not doing enough, enough, then what happens is you start to believe that you're not enough. And that doesn't translate into better serving our kids. So I just wanted to pause and just say, guys, look, no matter what's going on around you, the fact that you've taken this leap from physical classroom teacher to virtual classroom teacher without going to college, there are separate courses for you to become a university professor or a teacher online. They want you to take specific classes. We've gotten trainings on how to control and how to navigate platforms. And, and how to do all these different things, but learning how to virtually engage your students, learning how to build those relationships with your students and your parents, learning how to navigate Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting after Google Meet after Google Meet after, you know, knowing how to navigate all of that in the span that we've been able to do it. You are doing enough. You are enough. Because if you allow yourself to get so beat down by what people are saying, you'll be no good for your students. And I firmly believe our students deserve the best version of ourselves. And if we constantly keep getting told, I mean, it's just like you raising a kid and you tell a kid, you're not, you're not gonna be anything. I can attest, I've been there, of what happens when you tell a kid that you're not enough. And it's the same thing for adults. And I just wanted to pause before anybody else got deeper into it to just say simply, teach you. You are enough. You're doing enough. And just continue doing what you're doing. You know, man, and it makes me think a couple of points that I'll, I'll come to. But first is, you know, you are an advocate, a believer in if you speak things into the universe, they will become a reality. And, and I know at this point, I haven't gotten any parent emails yet because I don't even have my official roster yet. But I know I'm going to get them. Mm -hmm. and, and if you let people tell you, especially in this year, in this circumstance, 
in the hyper political world that we lived in, you know, if you let people tell you that, it will become your reality. And as teachers, we so off, it, it's an impossible job to separate as a teacher. If someone says you're not doing enough, it, it's almost impossible for you to separate. Well, that's just my job. That's not who I am because the vast majority of us, we do this because it's who we are. Mm -hmm. We do it because it's in our soul. And I just look at that and, and, and I know what a danger that is. And you know, we had our first real, the, the 11 person team, that's our distance learning team. So I'm on the distance learning team at my school. So I'm going to be teaching strictly virtual, at least to start the year. Um, I guess I'm teaching virtually indefinitely until we go back to something that resembles something more normal. But we were having, having conversation and I, and I brought the point up of, you know, like what happens when I get an email at seven in the evening and I have that first parent that's mad that I don't respond to an email at seven and my, and I'm so lucky to have the admin that I had, but they were like, you know what? That's a great question. And they said, you know, we need to figure it out, but everybody has to be on the same page when it comes to that expectation. So if we as a group of teachers say that when 4.30 hits, we're all going to put an autoresponder on that says, uh, I'm sorry, um, I'm out of my office or whatever you want it to say until 7 a.m., but you should expect to hear back from me right away in the morning, then we need to stick to that. And, and I think on the advice side, you have to, it, it comes back to boundaries. Mm -hmm. Like, and I think a difficult part of this school year, especially for people, not for everybody, in this new environment is setting the right boundaries and setting boundaries for your time. And, and I think the danger of saying you're not enough is like you said, it, some people can, it can be a trigger to say that I got to do more, I got to do more, I got to do more. There's more, more this year than there's ever been. There is more work to do and there's more work that can be done than there ever has been. And it's not to say that we shouldn't strive to do a ton, but I think teachers, whether you are in person, you're a hybrid, you're a distance learner, really need to be good about setting boundaries. Because I think as strange as it sounds that being enough doesn't seem like it should be about boundaries, but people who are enough set boundaries, like, no. Being enough, you forget how important it is to set boundaries because we're going to have to just accept that we're not going to get through as much content this year as we have been. And there are going to be more rough patches and bumps in the road than there ever has been. And, and to some degree, but not only that, you, you, no, go ahead. You also have to think about it from this point that <clears throat> the same bumps in the road that we would have in the classroom, we're experiencing those exact same things. The only difference is we're in a different vehicle. We're in a different vehicle. That's a great, and, that's a great analogy. I mean, because if you think about it, we face as teachers, we are faced with every year, the same challenges. How do we get to know students? How do we de 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 deliver the content in a meaningful way, in a relevant way? How do we get through all of the content? All of these things are, same, are challenges we face year in and year out. The only difference is instead of us physically being in the classroom with our students, we're online. You know, um, in our convocation, our, um, our, our superintendent said, whether we're screen to screen or face to face. And, and when I heard that, I said, it doesn't matter because we're teachers. The expectation for us, again, we said it ourselves, we are the 1%. We are the 
20% that drives and steers the 99. The doctors become doctors because of great teachers. The lawyers become lawyers because of great teachers. All these things happen because of the vehicle of education. So they know, everyone knows that what we, who we are at our core are the ones who can figure it out and can get it done. The question just becomes to, to leadership all over this country to say, what expectations are you setting for your staff members and your parents as to what to expect? I told my parents outright, direct, at six o'clock, I shut off from working. I'm available to you up till six o'clock. If you message me at 6.30 and I just happen to have not left this room that I'm in right now, because this is my working space, but once I go downstairs and I'm at home, I'm at home. And it's no different than if I left the school building and you sent me a message and I don't respond until the next day that I get back to the school building, you can't be angry with me because I didn't give you that rapid return because truth be told, I've been available since seven that morning up until six o'clock. And when you decided to message me at seven, eight or nine o'clock that night, the fact that I don't respond does not make me a bad person. It's not indicative of my character or saying you're a slacker or you're not going above and beyond. Yes, I am. Because you don't see behind the scene the, the 10 to 11 takes that it, get, it takes to make one video. You don't see the mistakes that teachers make in trying to translate what they do in the classroom to video form or to how can I adopt this virtually when I know I can't get feedbacks. When we're not, you know, our district, we can't force kids to turn their cameras on. So I can't look into your eyes and use that as a gauge to see whether or not you understand. Because if I'm sitting there in the classroom and everybody's like this, I know, okay, hold on, I'll back up. You got to do this again. But when I'm just looking at names across the screen, it is difficult to gauge and say, do you understand what's going on? Now there's a new method I have to say, okay, type in the chat box and let me know, thumbs up, thumbs down, if you understand what I'm saying. Or let me see, change your emoji and change your stat. Like there's different nuances that we have to develop. And since they know, but again, society knows it. They learned it last spring when we first got shut down, the need for teachers, how important our role is. Moving into this year, you can't expect teachers all of a sudden to say, I want you to give up your summer and learn how to do distance learning when we had no clue what distance learning was going to, whether or not we were even going to be distance learning. Up until it was time and now it's like, okay, now we're not going back face to face. The situation has changed. And now you're going to be forced to do this. So now you're giving most teachers a three week period to go from physical to virtual classroom teachers. And, and there are parents who, who have the audacity to complain in week one. In week one. I mean, that, that does, you know, the, the analogy that I gave my team is like, if I'm trying to potty train my child, if I'm potty training my child and the first time I take the pamper off and put underwear on them and they have an accident and I jump in and I spank their bottom, then now I've just induced shame onto that child. So now when that child has an accident, instead of coming to me saying I had an accident, they're going to take them off, change them, and hide them. So now as the adult, as the caregiver, what I have to deal with now is the fact that my child is shamed and afraid to come to me. And then I have to deal with the stench of them hiding their mistakes because they're ashamed. So we have to shift our mindset and give teachers some time. We will figure this out. I, I, I'm open and honest with my kids. They're like, Mr. Law, this didn't work. Hold on, hold on. this is my first time doing this. I'm trying, I'm learning as you're learning. You're telling me it's not working. Let me jump in here and get it. And I think right there, it it shows you the need, not, not so much with parents, and it is, but like to have that communication with kids, be like, you know, we're, we're riding on this together. So if something's not working, 
you need to tell me, like, I need to know so we can say like, okay, like, hey, this didn't work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I worked on a document a long time yesterday that is a schedule of my day. It tells me exactly when I have stuff. It tells me my open time. So I, and it's got bullet points in every time so I can write down notes like, okay, so, so, um, Max had this particular thing happen. Okay. Jenny had it happen and Jose had it happen. So I've got these seats. So you're connecting dots and saying, okay, so this is going, and then we're going to troubleshoot it. And it's, it's going to be that evolving thing to where it's going to change. Kids are going to have bad internet days. You're going to have bad internet days. Having one right now. Just got a message that says your internet is unstable. Yeah, you know, we're, we're going to have those days. And I think that is, you know, that word shame really spoke to me because I felt shame... I, we talked about this. I felt shame just with the idea before I took this position as a digital learner. I felt shame over potentially not going back to a classroom feeling like I wasn't doing my part. Because if you listen to what's going on around us, we should just suck it up. And there are states that are saying, well, now, now teachers, you've become essential infrastructure workers. So that way you're exempt from a two week quarantine if you're exposed. And now the CDC has apparently changed their guidelines to say that if you have been exposed, you don't need to quarantine for two weeks unless you start to have symptoms. Wow. And, wow. and granted, if you, it depends on where you read, but that seems to be a top down sort of change in the guidelines it's still saying you should but you're not required to and you're like not mandated to and, and i'll come back it took a global pandemic and a crisis in our country for you to call a teacher an essential infrastructure worker think if teachers had been treated the whole time forever like an essential infrastructure worker Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, it, you know, it, oh man, it, 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 it's, it's sickening to think that the people who are making the decisions are people who wouldn't be in the position they're in if they were not for a teacher. That's what blows my mind. You know, we talk about it all the time. There is not a profession on this planet. A, 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 let me say, an honorable profession on this planet that does not require a teacher. I don't even say any profession because if you want to become a good crook, you're going to talk to crooks. You're going to learn what crooks do. If you want to be a good, I mean, let I me, mean, let's be honest. If I want to be a good car thief, they say that jails become more less about rehabilitation and it becomes like a university for the criminal because they go in there with other people who teach them tricks and techniques so that the next time that they go out, if they choose to offend again, now I have a trick that OG told me I can do this and I won't get caught or I can do this to pay attention to that. So everything in life requires someone to be taught. The deer teaches their, their, their young, the young fawns, the routes to take and the migration routes to take and when to go into the thicket or when to go into the brush, when to, when to, all of that requires teaching. And as human beings, as much as we want to say we're the super, we're the super homo sapien that walks the earth, we would not be where we are if it were not for someone teaching us from our parents at a very young age to the college professor, the high school teacher, the, 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 mentor, the mentor that works with you. Everyone needs a teacher. So to say that teachers have never been essential, we've never been qualified as essential, but we've always been important. There's Education. Never, there's not a more essential job. No. Because again, if education fails, this country fails. Well, and you could really tie it 
the failings of our country can be tied to the failings of our education system. I wasn't gonna go there, but 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 that I mean, is a... and we don't and we don't need to go there. We can turn around because while you were talking about this and talking about the process and you know the metaphor of the the bumpy car, you know, because you know we were riding down the car, you know, we were riding down the road and you know, a pretty decent mid-size sedan that was pretty stable. And if things went haywire, it was pretty easy to handle. Mm -hmm. Now we're running down the road and, you know, a, a, one of those safari vehicles with no suspension that... Or a golf cart. A golf cart or, what you know, whatever it is. But I, while you were talking about that, I wrote down patience, grace, and empathy. So what do you think the role are of those three things? Because, I mean, talking about it, you know, and I was thinking, those words just came to mind. So let's just start with how can we help teachers give themselves patience, grace, and empathy? Because I think that is an overlooked part of it. And it comes back and it circles around to that point you made earlier of just being enough. If you believe you're enough, you can give yourself patience. You can give yourself grace. You can give yourself empathy. Mm -hmm. If you believe you're enough. And everything starts with what you believe, not what someone else tells you. It starts with what you believe. And what you believe, uh, this is, okay, I'm going to go there. What you believe is based off of what you know you do. I can't sit here and pretend to say that every single teacher that I know is doing 100% of what they need to do. I'm not going to sit here and pretend like there are teachers who are not still looking at this as I'm still on a paid vacation. I'm not going to sit here and pretend as if there are teachers who are not saying, oh, all I'm going to do is just do the bare minimum. I'm, I'm not going to pretend that. But what you believe is proportionate to what you know you do. So, I can extend myself patience when I know, when I hit the scale and I see that my weight hadn't moved, but yet still I can look back and say, I went to the gym five days a week. I ate four meals a day. All of them were low carb, were low fat. I had no sodas. Uh, uh, I made sure that I walked and stood up, you know, at least 15 minutes. Like when I look back at what I've done, I can be patient with the scale when it doesn't move the way I need it to move. Right? There's no sense of me getting anxious when I can look at it and say, I'm, I know I'm putting in the work. And again, one of the best things my, my former pastor used to always say, that if you can stand the process, progress is guaranteed. If you can stand the process, and right now we're in a process. So for teachers who know that you're putting in the work, take what the parents are telling you as, as a data point. Take it as a data point. You know, I've got negative feedback already in, in, in a week and two days. Seven days of instruction, of instruction. And I would really say two days of instruction because the whole first week, I was really trying to get to know my kids. And I was trying to let my kids get to know me and the platform. So it was, it was learning, but it wasn't content driven. It was context driven. I need you to know who you're dealing with the program we're dealing with, and I need to know who you are to know what I'm dealing with. It was contextual. Once we jumped into content, we only had two days of that. So I can't say how they work, but I can say in the contextual teaching to give the kids the backdrop of what they're doing, I got complaints. Well, why can't we do this? And I, I, teachers, I mean, I've seen parents send things like, y'all need to get your ish together. Like, and use the emoji. Y'all need to get your, and, and, and get the emoji with the hands over the mouth so you can imply what they're saying. And I'm saying, if we would put ourselves in the same position as teachers and as parents put our, I mean, as parents put ourselves in a position as teachers and as teachers put ourselves in a position of parents and know that both of us are equally invested in seeing students get better if we both walked a mile in our sh in each other's shoes, 
we would have more patience for one another. You know, and, and one thing that struck me in what you were saying is, you know, with your weight gain, or not your weight gain, but your uh, it was a gain. gain or what, but the lack analogy, of, lack, of losing. Used, lack mm -hmm. of losing. I think it's this year for myself, and I think for teachers in general, reflection is going to, it's got to be mandatory. You've got to be able to look back and say, I, these are all the things I've done and not in a way. So, and it's not keeping a checklist so you can show it to somebody like, Hey, look at all these things I've done. It's a, I'm going to show it to myself so I can say like, you know, I've done all of these things as you reflect on it. It's so you can say, I did all these things. And, and when you have that moment, cause like you said, as teachers, especially this year, we're all going to have that moment where a parent is going to be unhappy mm -hmm. and we're going to have some moments where we're unhappy with ourselves but in looking at it if you're keeping track and just saying like these are the things I'm doing these are the things I believe are important it, I know it's hard and I know it doesn't feel good because it's so much easier to to have that checklist and just try to please everyone and try to do as much as you can. I, I think short term, it's more gratifying to be able to say, well, I did this, I did what you asked, but in the long term, it's not beneficial for you. It's not beneficial for our kids, you know, and, and all of this has made me think like our kids are going through this same thing. If we're hearing it, I'm sure that they're hearing it and I'm sure that they're feeling like, they're not enough and the things that they're they're doing are and believe it or not i've heard that already i've heard parents chime in and say but i just want them to be doing more i just want them to be doing more i just want them to be doing more and my statement was simple give it time give it time and i go back to uh in the men's group Men in, men in education, plug for it. Big shout out to Hal Bowman for putting that together, man, uh, and inviting us to be a part of that group. And, and, you know, I was looking at the numbers yesterday about just a short plug for, for the men in education. To go from, that was around April when we launched to today, and now we're already at over 700 members, all men in education from around this globe, I mean, from around this country. And the information that comes through that that's filtered down for us men is so huge and pertinent to our position in education. And I think big shout again, big shout out to Hal for um, we had him as we, we, we were on his podcast and and he shot us that, that invitation to be a part of that group. And I, I thank him for it. But Greg Wilk Wolcott posted um, a message for the start of this year. Did you get a chance to read that one about I haven't yet. Uh, well, he posted about looking at this year as if you were climbing Mount Everest. And he broke down the four stages that you as necessary in order to reach the summit of Mount Everest and then gave practical tips of how it resembles right now what we're in, what we're encountering as teachers. Almost like a survival guide. Man, so amazing. Like I sent it to my entire math team and was like, guys, when you get an opportunity, read this. It fired me up because it made me realize where my positioning was in this year. Am I in boot camp or am I in base camp? I feel like I'm in base camp. I feel like the prep work has already been there because, you know, you and I have been talking about this hybrid model of school and educating, getting more technology used getting kids more digital citizenship, showing them how to be more, more uh, responsible with their, you know, on self-learning and self-guided instruction. We've been having this conversation for at least the last two years. Um, and so I felt like that was my boot camp phase. I didn't know yet that I was going to climb Mount Everest. I didn't know that COVID, Mount, Mount COVID was going to come and put everybody in a position to where they would have to climb this and traverse the terrain 
So I feel like I'm at base camp, but that's still just one part. You haven't started to climb yet. Well, and I think people underestimate the importance of base camp. Mm. Like in that reference, if you don't acclimate yourself to the conditions, I mean, because base camp of Everest is like 13 or 14,000 feet. That's like almost as high as the highest peak in the continuous 48 states. If you try to go on that trip without acclimating yourself to it, it's going to go sideways in a hurry. Mm -hmm. And the consequences will be serious. Mm -hmm. But he gave two points. His two points in this was, when you get ready to hike Everest, you have to expect snow. And again, I'm just quoting him. I'm reading what he wrote. He said, we're going to have good days and bad, and that's normal. Again, we can't get down on ourselves. We have done this before. We have to expect snow. And then the next one was, no one summons Everest alone. We are a team tied to one another, helping one another to get to the top. We can't be afraid to lean on each other for help as we get to the top. We got this. And when he posted that, man, I'm telling you, my mind instantly started visualizing the feat of climbing a mountain. And I started thinking about all the things. And I'm thinking about when he said there are going to be good days and bad days. Parents are going to complain. You know, even Chick-fil-A, you know, everybody loves Chick-fil-A. Uh, 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 even Chick-fil-A with their wonderful service and, and you know, how else may I serve you mentality and what else can I do to make you have a better day? I mean, they, they, they push this in every community they put one in. There's still people who complain about some things at Chick-fil-A. There's still people who will complain about, oh, well, my server forgot my straw or they gave me a salad without a fork. Or one that I heard recently as I was doing a, a search for complaints um, on Chick-fil-A service, one person said, I only had one tomato in my salad. That's your complaint. Not that the salad was bad or that it was under, the, the, the chicken was undercooked or that there was only one tomato in my salad. So people will find anything to complain. If they complain about only having one tomato in a meal that they enjoyed, trust me, they're gonna complain about something that you're doing in your classroom. Trust me. And that gets us back to that point that you said about grace. We have to give ourselves the grace that's needed for us to fail, for us to blunder, for us to make those mistakes. Because grace is, I'm not going to give you what you deserve. So when parents are calling unruly, I'm not going to get upset. You know, I got a bunch of sh what I call you can see, you can you can you can you can hear the tone in the email that was sent. You know, and when I read it, initially something bubbled up, and I calmed down, and I typed an email that didn't reflect my reaction, it was a true response to their question. You know what I mean? And so when we allow ourselves to do that, you'll shut down a lot of negativity really fast. Because again, I really honestly believe we're all in the same boat. Parents, teachers, administrators alike. We wanna make sure that we get through this year and our students are, are better prepared for the world that they're facing. And I feel like going through this crisis now and dealing with what we're doing with, we're teaching our kids some valuable lessons about what's most important, about how to get along in life, about how to recover in life, about how to move past adversity, how to adjust and adapt, how not to make excuses. You know, I share with my kids in my first large group, I say, we're asking you guys as sixth graders just leaving elementary school to do something that we typically would ask of high school seniors when they get ready to go off to college, which is <clears throat> you have courses that are scheduled, 
you're responsible for getting up and going to those courses when you when you want to. You're responsible for making sure that you turn in those assignments. You're responsible. I say, so we're asking you now to be what you're going to be in the next six years right now. So think about where you're going to be in the next six years. By the time you get out of high school, these kids should be entrepreneurs starting their own business. They should be the thinkers that's going to solve a lot of our world problems. They're our world problems. They're, they're going to be the, 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 the innovators that create something just so outlandish that it's like, oh my God, I can't think, I, I can't believe I've never thought about this before in my life. That's what's going to come out of this if we do what we're supposed to do. And that's make sure that we stay calm under fire. Those patients, we extend the grace that we want to get extended to us. And we show empathy in a way that will make people believe I'm not I'm not patronizing you. I'm not putting you down. I'm not saying, oh, okay, I understand. No, I'm genuinely saying I'm with you. So when parents say things like, you know, I'm struggling to make sure that they get online. I got a, I got a ninth grader that I still have to make sure I wake up in the morning because I'm not 100% sure if she's going to wake up with her alarm. I ask, what time is your alarm going off? I don't expect you to get up when I get up. I get up way too early. I know that. But when your alarm goes off, I want to know so that if I hear it and you don't move, I come in there to get you. What time is your first class start? I want to know that so that I can make sure that when I look at the clock, if it's 930 and I know that I don't see you logged in and doing things, then I'm asking, well, why are you not getting ready for class? I still have to do that while maintaining teaching my courses and making sure other people's student kids are doing the exact same thing. You know, my heart goes out. I was watching my sister post on Facebook. Uh, her, she's an assistant principal, and she has two toddlers that's in, one's in kindergarten, one's in pre-K. So not only is she trying to manage her school and do the work that she does, she's also trying to manage the work that they are responsible for because they are synchronous. They're not asynchronous. So when the teacher says, I need you online at 10 o'clock, I got to make sure you're online at 10 o'clock. And if I have a meeting at 10 o'clock, then I'm in my Zoom call while you and your Zoom call with your headphones. And I need to make sure that you're paying attention at the same time that I'm paying attention to doing. That's some superhero stuff. And that's what our teachers and educators all over this country are doing right now. They're doing it right now. So for those teachers who still say, I'm doing everything I can, I just can't take it because they keep telling me I'm not enough, you are. Keep being the superhero that you've always been. Keep wearing your cape. Keep, keep doing everything that you're supposed to be doing and making sure you put our students first. And then whatever comes, just know that you, you're on Everest. You got to expect the snow. Got to expect the snow.